So joining me on today's uh, podcast or this episode of the podcast even is is Wayne Hallern of Body Works Clinic here in Waterford. Wayne is a neuromuscular therapist who uh, works in the area of uh, physical therapy and injury rehab. Wayne, thanks very much for joining me. No problem at all, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Anytime. But, um, so tell me, what is, uh, what's life like in lockdown for a, a neuromuscular therapist? <laughs> it's interesting. Um, yeah, I suppose like everyone else, the, the first couple of weeks you're trying to adjust to it. And then the last week or so has been tough now. The walls have been closing in a bit, but... Um, there's plenty to keep me going. I've been doing a lot of studying, I guess, and uh, spending a lot more time with the family and doing the gardening and you know just brushing up on things really. But you're finding all those jobs you put on the long finger and they're coming back to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I have to admit, uh, my wife Sarah killed me for saying this, but she wanted me to paint the, the banister uh, on the stairs <laughs> um, with the last, I'd say, the last twelve months easily. And it's just, no, I won't do it. If it's a blank wall, I'll paint that, no bother. But getting it around all those little um, creases yeah. and stuff in a, on a banister is, is my idea of, yeah, a, of, yeah, of absolute yeah. hell. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, so tell me, uh, what does is, what is kind of a typical day look like now that you're, um, I suppose, working remotely? Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Like the, a typical day, say, would be, like I'm up early. I'm up early every morning with the kids and off half five, six o'clock. So... It's a, it's a, yeah, 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 it's an early start. So the usual breakfast routine is still there, but the school routine is out the window now. So you just fill those couple of hours with a little bit of playtime with the boys or whatever needs doing around the house. And then I'm, uh, I'm doing some online consultations, which has been good. Um, so that's part of the daily routine now. Uh, then I'm breaking that up. Then when I don't have consultations, I'm trying to dip in and out of, you know, brushing up on all things that I would have studied before and taking in some new information. And I've done, I've done a good few new courses over the last couple of weeks, which has been really good. Um, sometimes find the time, you struggle to find the time to do things like that. So a uh, little bit of a blessing in the skies that way. It's given me an opportunity to do some of the things that I wanted to do, you know. Very good. Um, and have, I suppose, have your, your clients found the transition easy or is it something that you've kind of had to almost promote and say well look even though I can't get hands on we, we can still work together like yeah it's um for newer clients I, I think it's a little bit more uh tricky to get their heads around that, that you, you don't need to put your hands on but with older clients that I've had our current clients it's a lot easier for me because a lot of what I would do turns into more hands off like I'm very very hands off in the in the middle to late stages even in the early stages of rehab um, so the current clients was a little bit easier because it's a continuation of them coming in to see me in the clinic say session two and three i don't put hands on anyone it's right show me how you're moving now where 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 are you lacking in that movement how do we move better to you know give you back what your body's looking for um whereas the newer clients it's like hang on a minute i've got a knee pain how can how can you help me without digging the elbow into the back of the hamstring or you know, that part is the, is the trickier part, I guess. So you do kind of promote that side a little bit. But um, anyone who's been working with me for a while knows it, it's a continuation, but we're not in the same room. And do you find it's interesting that you said the old elbow and the hamstrings? Do you find that some people, when they come to you, that's that's it might not be what they need, but that's what they want. They just want to be <laughs> absolutely savaged for about 40 minutes and, and limp out and tell all their friends, that not a great old robot weighing their hamstrings and ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean sometimes that does happen um like i suppose it, it, it even in my experience mark like going back to when i would have got physio treatments done that that's what you got you know that was that was yeah. the done thing so a lot of people still have that expectation that oh look my uh, my knee is sore my calf is sore i've got a tight hamstring i know what I, I know what i need i need someone to dig it out for me for a half an hour and then i'll be fine again for a few weeks but um like new evidence and research, it's, it's continuously changing. So we, we know now that that's not the most effective way to create a longer lasting change. Yeah, short term benefits and short term gains, but it really is in that time on the table. We're just creating a very minor change to tissue and you'll feel better for a while, but you're going to fall back into the same old patterns. And so you, you have to try and match people where they want, you know? Yeah, you're like you said, you're 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 balancing on the line between what they need and what they want. Cause if you don't give them what they want, they mightn't come back yeah. to you and they won't get what they need. Um, yeah, 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 but yeah. like you said, it, it's the, the old school way of 
like do a, a 45 minute massage on a tight hamstring and that yeah. fixes your tight hamstring. But yeah. the reason your hamstring is tight could be because you have, um, say from a, a forward tilt pelvis or- Yeah, that's exactly you, it. Yeah. You know, you have an old injury, you're guarding and, yeah. Yeah. and everything comes from that. So, yeah. so, so I have tr- I have awful tricky questions here written down for you now. Um, <laughs> But uh, we'll, we'll start with Daniel. So what would be the most common um, injuries or I suppose, pain that people will come into you with? Um, I would treat a lot of athletes. Um, so I tend to see ankle sprains, knee trouble, hip pain, shoulder. It, it, it's tough. It's a, it's a big variety. Um, knees, knees, if I was to put a, a finger on it, it's probably a knee pain is the one I'd see the most of. Um, but I, outside of athletes, then just say general population, we're not athletic. I would see a lot of lower back pain. Okay. So those would be my two lower back pain, knee pain would be the two top ones. But I see a wide variety from broken toes or broken bones in the feet all the way through to like tension headaches. Yes. So it's a big spectrum, but knee and back pain are probably the two biggest ones. Um, if it's okay with you, what we'll do is we might focus a little bit on both of those for a, a few minutes and just dig in because yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, it's something that I would have had experience with myself in terms of uh, when I qualified as a therapist working from home, I don't do it anymore. Um, but you were always kind of told that right, someone has knee pain and um, you work upstream and downstream um, mm-hmm. because nine times out of 10, the knee in itself might not be the issue. It's coming from instability at the hip or the ankle or tightness in muscles that are, uh, trying to work through issues somewhere else. Um, and do you see it yourself in the clinic that people would, how do I even word it? Do people come into you, I suppose, with, with trauma type injuries more so, or would it be, uh, I suppose, unexplained pain? Do you know, like people are just strolling around, they say it's like a sore knee, but they don't play yeah. sport, they're not exercising. Yeah. Do you know, it's nothing, it's nothing obvious. Yeah, yeah, and that's probably the one I see the, the most of in terms of um, people's movement or how they're moving or how often they move. They'll start to feel these little niggles and bits and pieces. So you can't put your finger on and say, you know, I was running and I fell off the curb and all of a sudden I got this, this pain. I do see that, but the more common would be I've taken up running. Um, I've been running for the last month or so. I, I never had an injury before. Everything's fine, but now I've got this little niggly pain in my knee now. But I, I, nothing happened to cause it. You know, yes. that's, that's kind of the more common ones I would see. And then you're, you're looking at instead of tissue damage per se, it's more overload somewhere in the, in the system or somewhere in the kinetic chain of how the body moves. And how does, that, how does that happen? Is that purely a lack of movement? Is it, in a, like, is it uh, not having adequate strength to take... I suppose the training load of whatever the person is doing, or is it a mixture of both, mm-hmm. or is it something yeah. else entirely? It's it's hard to it's hard to put a finger on it. Like what you're doing is every single person comes into me, and um, regardless if two people have the same knee problem, the same pain in the same place, it won't be the same cause. It's very rare that you come across the exact same reason for someone to have the same type of knee pain. Yes, there's commonalities in them. Um, you are looking more so of, uh, I'm trying to, when you come in, I, I, I put you through an assessment. So I literally just get you to move, just six or seven very simple basic movements. See where your body's comfortable to go, where it's not comfortable to go. Um, what around those joints needs to shorten and lengthen in terms of muscle structure? And why are you protective of those areas? Then the conversation leads to, okay, give me your injury history. Give me, you know, Go back as far as you want. I don't mind. So 15 years ago, I fell off a bike and broke my ankle. Yes. And now, 15 years later, that knee is starting to give me pain. Okay, so then, then I'm trying to link that assessment of how I saw you move to what's happened in your timeline that's caused now your brain or your body to take a different pattern, a different strategy of movement. And can I give it back? And then it would, that will free up that knee pain. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like the way you said we look at movement first, um, yeah. talk about injury history, and then you try to link them both. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think all too often people will um, simply look at their, their own history, I suppose, from their own point of view and say, well, I haven't done anything, so this pain 
it, it came from nowhere. But yeah. as you said, if you if you dig and if you're a good enough investigator, I suppose, mm-hmm. um, someone like yourself will be able to kind of say, well, look, best chances are that this is more than likely what's happening. Um, yeah. And I'm using the word more than likely because I used to say to my own clients that I can never give you 100% that this is definitely what's happening because I can't see inside your body. I don't know for definite. Yeah. But yeah. if you put in place these certain treatment protocols and things start to regress or so your pain is less, you know, yeah. you know that you're on the right track and we might as well yeah. keep going. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm curious to know what kind of movements do you get people to go through? Um, can you give me an example of one? Yeah, so yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, someone comes like into your basic, clinic. Yeah. So like a basic toe touch okay. is, is a movement I get people to do. And that, that shows me what happens at the foot, what happens at the knee, what happens at the pelvis, what happens at the rib cage, what happens at the shoulders, and what happens at the neck. So I get a full body picture from that one single movement. So are you someone who has a very hip dominant strategy for touching your toes? Are you struggling to depress and retract your rib cage? You know, is your pelvis instantly tilting? You know, are your knees breaking too early? Is that, is, are you, you know, are you able to plant or flex, dorsiflex? Can your big, is your big toe still in contact with the floor when you do that movement? So you pick up so much information and then you try and link it back. Yeah, that person twisted their ankle or they broke that big toe. Now their body's not comfortable putting load through the front half of that foot. So now they can't put their hips back. You know, so it's, it's a very simple movement, but it t- tells you an awful lot. And I suppose what you can often tell, you can often tell by someone as well is, and you'll probably see it a lot more than I do, is that if you ask them to do a certain movement, like a toe touch, they'll almost react in the way that they move. As in, if someone goes, you kind of <laughs> rolls the eyes, you know that, oh, Wayne, I can't, I can't do that. Do you know, yeah, or yeah. It, hurt, it hurts when I do that. Or you see... I suppose the way they might even breathe going into the way, oh, their breath, exactly. they're trying to touch exactly. their toes like that. And you're kind yeah. of looking at them going, well, I'd obviously a lot of tension in that movement. They're, they're yeah. minding themselves, they're, they're worried. Yeah. So, and how much of, like you mentioned, we'll say, um, they might not be able to, to move their ankle, um, plantar mm-hmm. flex, dorsiflex, uh, for anyone who have no idea what it is, point your toes up, point your toes down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, like that, if, if you find that someone, um, is guarding or is has mm-hmm. a, an old injury at a site how much of that is physical and how much of that is is purely psychological because i know like i have terrible ankles so if i'm playing a game yeah. of ball I'm, I'm i'm wary you know if i if i roll an ankle yeah. ah, it, it's going <laughs> it's not gonna stop yeah. <laughs> um so how much of it it in your own kind of opinion or your own clinical expertise how much of it is psychological and how much of it is actually your your body saying we physically can't do this anymore yeah yeah um that that comes down again to to good assessment mark so look there might be times where there is like a structural issue where you know you've you've twisted an ankle so bad that you've moved the bone out of place or something funny you know now it, it's not very common i do i guess psychological is a is a difficult word to use i think in in that term i think i think there's more fear avoidance so it's more being afraid, like you touched on it there. If that, I, I know if I go out and play, that ankle is going to go. So That's you, my you're, excuse, you're I'm almost, sticking to it. <laughs> but you're almost preempting when you walk out to play football or whatever it is. You're, you're, there's a fear that that ankle is going to go. So your, your brain is going to be already in a protective state every time your foot hits that floor. So its uh, reaction is going to be, right, how do I get him to slow down on this? How do, how how do we protect this area? Like stiffen it up. How do we stiffen it up? Send a signal to the muscle to contract a little bit more than it should do. Then you're going to feel, oh, geez, my calves are really tight. Yes. You know, or I can't change direction. I don't feel fluid. So one of the things I'm trying to give back to people is a good movement, good fearless movement, thoughtless movement. Just, just don't think about it. Just, just move. Now, that sounds very simple. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, but... It- Sometimes I think as well that it, it takes no one a hell of a lot about something to make it as simple as possible. To try and yeah. Make, and, to try yeah, and break yeah. something down. Um, yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah. I mean, you, you do see 
some extraordinary stuff on on Instagram and things like that. You know, people leaping around on BOSU balls and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And <laughs> and for me, it's more how simple. What what's the simplest movement I can get with the least amount of effort to create the biggest possible change? And right. and that's how you get people to do the rehab work. Not sending them home at twenty exercises with loads of equipment. It's one, maybe two, and get really, really good at this. Very, and very that's good. going to make a big change. How do you, how do you hold your, your clients? I, I don't know if accountable is the right way to use, is the, is the right way to say it. Um, yeah. But it, I remember starting out doing the therapy, I'd offer clients a couple of movements or stretches when they go home, and mm-hmm. you might book them in for two weeks' time to see how they're doing. They come in, yeah. you might do single leg balance type stuff, and they're falling all over and say, what are you doing then? Nah, nah. I, 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 didn't go, I didn't do them exercises for the last three weeks. But it, it, it's not feeling great. Just give me that 45 minute rub down again, sure, and I'll be good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So now, dealing with athletes, I'm hoping that they would be more, they'd have more, what's the word, like self efficacy. They, they want to do it, they know they have to do it. But do you, do you look after them outside of sessions, or is it a case of, I'll see you in two weeks' time, make sure you do them, and I'll talk to you after? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know funny enough is that like some athletes are very good <laughs> others yeah. are just I just want to get back on the road <laughs> um, but in, ter- in terms of that what I, what I do is like say for example I would give a client a couple of videos um, to do and I'd ask them to record themselves and send it back to me Brilliant. so it's a small thing but if, it, if I don't get the video back then I know something's not quite right there. Or you might get a text say, look, I didn't get a chance to give you the video, but I'm doing those movements. Yes. So there's a little bit of accountability on that side of things. Um, and I think the conversation I have with people in clinic is, is key because you, you need to effectively explain why this is important. So it's not ju- I'm not just giving you these for the sake of it and sending you home. This is the specific reason why if you do these, you're going to get better. Very good. And then you get more buy-in, I suppose, Mark, is the, is the word you're looking for. But yeah. you, you, you have to show the benefit. Like, why, why is this going to improve my back pain, my ankle pain, my knee pain? You know, because it, it, even, with, even with athletes or, or just general population, there's only a couple of things they want. How, how long is this going to take? When will the pain be gone? And when can I get back to doing what I was able to do? So, so if you can show why the rehab bridges the gap between those three things you've got more chance of that person being successful and being self-efficacy as you say they look after themselves then you know what what is the difference then between being i suppose recovered from an injury and Mm -hmm. being able to go back playing because like there's a difference between not having pain and then being able to fully function um, like you'd have, I know down through the years, training teams and stuff, guys that have uh, ACLs done or they've torn hamstrings and stuff like that. And they, they feel fine. You know, they do a little bit of light yeah. stretch and it feels good. Yeah. They're kind of, they're poking themselves in the leg going, yeah, no, it feels good. There's no pain there. A little <laughs> bit of a light stretch. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but one sprint or one wrong turn and boom, it's gone again. Gone again. Um, yeah. So is there, is there a fine line between, no pain and being back to full function in terms of recovering from an injury or like, as you said, is there, is there a continuum? There's probably no simple answer to that. And I know I'm, I'm I'm throwing it at you, but no, it's um, it's a good question. How do you know someone is is ready to go back to play or train at full tilt? I would bring someone through a return to play protocol. Um, So I, in, in terms of, in terms of having no pain and being able to play, you said like, the, is there a fine line? For, for me, there's actually, there's a gap. Okay. So it's not a fine line. So when that pain goes away, um, are you fully recovered? No. You know, the pain is gone. Yeah, absolutely. Now it depends, okay. If you're a 60-year-old lady who just wants to walk up the stairs versus an athlete who needs to go full maximum sprint, there's a difference. Yeah, so there, there will be a slight variation on how much you need to do. But what it comes down to is, uh, loading it's it's progressive loading it's gradually reintroducing those things that you had to do again so if you've 
torn a hamstring, for example, and you've gone through all the early stage rehabilitation and you're back in pain free and your hamstring feels great and you're saying, you know what, I feel really good. And, and I've been guilty of this. I've had many a hamstring problems through the years and you feel great. You go back out on the pitch, 30 minutes in, hamstring goes again. Yeah. You've skipped so many stages to get to that sprint. You've, you, you've not got the right to go onto that pitch if you can't single leg bridge, if you can't hop, if you can't uh, go 40 meters at 50% six, seven times and gradually increase that up to, you, you've no right to go back sprinting. So my, my thing will be, you have stages, you have, it's not, it's not sessions at time, it's more, it's more almost milestones or tick in the box. Can you hop in a straight line? Can you stick a landing? Can you change direction? Can you be mobile rotating on that, on that foot? So there will be criteria. It will be different for each person, but there is, for me, a return to play. Um, the athletes that come back stronger, they're the ones that put the effort in. I, I love the, the fact that you said there's no fine line, there's a, there's a gap. I like that. And, and there really is. Um, and I think it's a nice way of even explaining um, to players that look it's not a case of three rubs on a hamstring a bit of static mm -hmm. stretching while you're watching Game of Thrones for the four time and then you yeah. can go out on Thursday in the piss and rain and the wet ground and expect yeah. to twist and turn and sprint and stop and exactly. you know take the physicality of whatever sport that you're in yeah. Um, yeah. and expect you to be 100% um, that's exactly it yeah. no I really like that uh, so in terms of if I get injured I get up off my yeah. chair now and 20 minutes, half an hour, and I go, oh, geez, my hamstring, right? Um, what, what happens in your body? What are the stages? So you get an injury. Um, what is supposed to happen within your body, and, and how long does it take? Because one of the things you obviously get, and I've had it numerous times myself, is, um, geez, my hamstrings feel a little bit sore. How long will that take to recover? Or, do you know, yeah. is, is it, everyone always thinks, oh, it's, it's two weeks for that, it's four weeks for this, it's eight weeks for that, and then you're back out on the pitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what, what actually happens um, when you get injured? Yeah, so if it's, um, like, if, if let's just t take a, a regular, we keep touching on hamstrings, <laughs> but if, um, if you <laughs> tweak a hamstring, right, so you're going to cause a little bit of damage to the fibres of the muscle, or maybe the tendon, or whatever it might be. So that's kind of the first stage of it. You've caused a, some kind of trauma to the muscle tissue. You've got a pain sensation, and your body will go into a little bit of protective mode, and that's when you start getting your swelling. So you're going to have some kind of inflammation, a little bit of bruising. Uh, and that's really, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's to slow you down. It's to restrict the, the movement so that you're not continuously causing more damage. And the second one is like that inflammation stage, it's where your body floods the area with the cells it needs to heal, to rebuild whatever collagen or proteins or whatever it might be that it needs at the time. And, and you know, your, your body's cleverer than anyone else will be. It knows what it needs when it needs it. Um, it does have a tendency to overinflate the area. Um, so there's no real, like, uh, I need 10% here. I need it just flood the area, restrict the movement, get in there, clean it all out. So get rid of all the, 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 the bad blood, whatever it might be, and get all the new collagen, lay down the fibers, and just pack the area again. Then you kind of move into like your repair phase and your remodeling phase. So these are where those, the new tissue that's been put down is now taking form. So is it uh, like a fast twitch fiber, a slow twitch fiber? Is it a collagen fiber? Is it, and that, that's where, you can help in terms of the rehabilitation side of things. Um, one thing on the inflammation is, and I see this a lot, is people are just really, really like, how can I, how can I make this part faster? I'll, I'll just take a whole heap of anti-inflammatories. It'll take away all the swelling, and I should be back up and running quicker. It's, it's, not, it's not the case. Um, like in, in my opinion and my experience, it, I've seen it delay returns because you're stopping an essential process. Your body needs that inflammation to heal, and you're taking a tablet that just stops it. Yeah, so, I think it's it's. I think we've almost been brainwashed to think inflammation is a bad thing. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And it isn't. It's it's key. It's it's part of this kind of four stage process that your body goes through when it's trying to recover and heal again. And um, so I'm I'm never a fan of anti-inflammatories as like a prescription or anything like that. Compression is okay. 
um, compression will just help to move the fluid around. So it won't yeah. stop the fluid getting there, but it will just help to move it around. Um, ice, I mean, the, the, the kind of rice principle, the old rice principle has been put out the window a long while now, but it still seems to be the one thing that everyone goes to. Yeah. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. And that, that's been, I won't say done away with, but it's been certainly revised and newer protocols have been put in place for it. But it used to be believed that ice was great and it would take away everything and, you know, kill the inflammation. And it's, it's really within the first couple of hours, if you want to help not to blow up the ankle completely, say, a little yeah. bit of ice. But after that, it's, 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 it's irrelevant. It's, it's there for pain management then more than anything else. I was just about to say, um, like that, I've always kind of told people, like, use ice in the, like, the acute phase. So if you've just done your ankle, right? Yeah. If, if you're in the middle of a pitch, you're not going to have someone giving you a morphine injection or, or pumping you a paracetamol <laughs> or like that. Yeah. So it's nice to yeah. have it there because that cold sensation just takes away yeah. from the, oh, fuck, it just did in my ankle sensation. Yes. You know, yes. Um, Mm-hmm. And I think another thing as well that's worth mentioning, and I, I hope you'll agree with me on this, you might not, it's fine if you don't, is that um, <laughs> inflammation kind of acutely is no harm. But if you have long-term mm-hmm. um, chronic inflammation, there's yeah. something, yeah. your body's trying to heal something. There's something not yeah. right wherever you have that inflammation. Um, yep. Do you know, if you're constantly in pain somewhere and like I suppose doctors have a lot to answer for in terms of right, just take uh, anti-inflammatories, you know, yeah, yeah. do a bit of stretching, maybe start yoga, you'll be grand. Um, yeah. So I think a, a lot of what you're saying, I would totally agree with in the sense that um, I've seen articles that are saying instead of rice, use meat. I don't know if you've come across it, but instead no. of, um, they're saying, so meat, M, M would be for movement. Um, yeah. E is for exercise. A, I think, is um, analgesics. It's the American way of saying painkillers. Uh-huh, and, uh-huh. Uh, T, I'm on the spot now, and I have no scripts on it. Forget my T. Is. <laughs> I think T might be treat, possibly treat. Yeah. Okay, um, okay. So basically saying that, look, while Royce has some merits, yeah, yeah. you know, if, you were, if you're looking to actually boost your, your ability to heal quickly, then don't, yeah. don't necessarily ice it chronically. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. just like you said nice for pain relief but yep. you know you're kind of like yeah. if you run out onto a pitch and you have the ice pack it's maybe to get a player to forget the pain and say look you're worrying about the cold yeah. now it's time to get on with it um, but like that I, I, I'm liking what you're saying because it, <laughs> it, all, it goes against common knowledge suppose, yeah yeah and, and I think that's that's probably uh, maybe a little bit of education for for people and it's one of the first things that i'll i'll have a chat with people if they come into me injured they've had the injury like oh i got injured two or three weeks ago i kind of i'll have a little conversation and just say look if this ever happens again it's the first few days that you need to be contacting me because those are the most important days not two three weeks later when you've already maybe have entered into that remodeling phase yes and now your that range of motion in that ankle is not what it used to be and you, you've, you've kind of set that a little bit, and then we've got to undo it slowly. Whereas if I get you in early, there's a, there's a key kind of principle called optimal loading, and that's, that's what I would use. So if you come in with a really bad ankle, Mark, I might, I might lie you down on the floor and get your foot up on a foam roller and just have you moving the foot back and forward like this. And that's the optimal load for you at that time. You can't tolerate anymore, so that's yes. what we do. Then when that becomes a little bit easier, I might get you up on your feet and doing the exact same thing, but now you've got gravity and body weight. So that's now the optimal load for you. Very so good. we progress these things very gently, but effectively. And then eventually then your optimal load becomes, all right, I can get back walking again. But that happens a lot faster if you start it earlier. Yes. With, with guidance. I think that's the key thing here. Yeah? Don't go off by yourself. and just start... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, it, it's very specific to each person's tolerance or each person's tissue loading capacity at that time is yeah. going to be different. Like you don't want someone saying uh, doing 40 meter sprints on a rainy night in January two weeks after a hamstring strain saying, I'm just optimally loading the hamstrings. I'll be yeah. going, I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And is, is that uh, an important part of it as well? Because like I said, we've, I've, I've done my ankle twice. Um, but the second time that I did it, I was very conscious of, I suppose, 
walking on it as much as I could tolerate in terms of the discomfort levels, moving yeah. it as much as I could, as much as the inflammation would let me. Um, yeah. And like, I think it was uh, my mother got a crutch off my uh, cousin and brought it down to the house and said, now I want you using that crutch, now you're in bits, you know, you need to go see a doctor yeah. and blah, blah. And I said, yeah, grand, thanks, took the crutch. But I think they used it for a day. And in the end, I was like, you know what? I, I still want to walk, but I'll walk really yeah. slowly and really mindfully yeah. and, and watch myself. Um, yeah. But I found I recover quicker after doing that than the first time I did it when I was on the couch and there was ice packs and there was pillows and there yes. was DVD yes, box yes, yes. sets. And I, I, yeah. I did Beko as little as possible because yeah. it hurt yeah. me to do it. So I decided not to. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's probably the, the key thing there is if you do nothing, then you're showing your, your, your brain, your brain controls everything that happens inside um, regardless, but you're showing your brain that that's the safest place they can be. And your brain's primary objective is survival. That's what we're designed as humans to do, just survive. So if you sitting on your arse all day on the couch, is you surviving pain-free and you know your body feels good, your ankle is going to stay very, very stiff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you, can, if you can demonstrate to your nervous system and your brain that, you know what, this little bit of discomfort is okay, it's, I, I'm, we're still in a safe environment, I'm in control, you will gradually get better quicker. I like that because when you say you, you need to convince yourself that it's okay and that you're in mm -hmm. control, um, I think a lot of people, when they have, I suppose, even... Uh, low back pain we could probably switch to chat mm -hmm. um if someone has totally unexplained low back pain yep. right yep. um unexplained to them you know someone like yourself might say there's very rarely no explanation for it there's, there's a reason <laughs> for it but yeah. like someone is, is sitting on the couch and they get up and their, their back hurts them they're driving their back hurts them and uh, they're sitting on a mm -hmm. stool in the pub and their back is hurting and they get up in the morning and their back is hurting them. um how much of that type of pain is, I suppose, bred from, let's say, it hurts me when I do this, so, and then it hurts me when I did this, then it hurts me when I did this, so I can't do any of that or it'll cause me pain. Yeah. So now yeah. your brain is associating those types of movements or those types of scenarios yeah. with pain. Is, that, is, is exactly. that a fair kind of reflection of, of what happens? It is, yeah, it is. Um, there's, there's probably, like, lower back pain is one, one that you could talk about for hours on end, there's, there's so many factors that influence, especially like a non-specific um, back pain, like a, a, not an injury as such. Um, emotional trauma, stress in, in everyday life, sleep, nutrition, hydration, the list is endless. They, they all feed in. Um, and your body can have like a pain response to that. Uh, and that's a lot of time where you see non-specific back pain coming from. Um, now, what what I can influence um, will help, but it may be you need to change jobs. Yeah. It, you know, it could be something like that. And so it's difficult to put a, a finger on exactly what a lower back pain comes from. But as you touched on with, the, with your mind there, let's say every day I go to a job that I don't like, every single day I get up out of that bed, I'm going to get a back pain because I don't, I'm, I'm emotionally traumatized because i have to go to work yeah. does that make sense yeah yeah um, absolutely and then like, likewise if i go down to touch my toes and my back pain happens my brain is going to continuously send that signaling to say don't touch toes yeah because, because of a past experience so our past experiences are, are key when it comes to your current kind of pain presentation so that's again why linking it back to the to the client's history of what's happened is so important. You know, it could have been a car crash from 20 years ago that you don't even notice. But every time you go to that car, subconsciously, your mind is taken back to that place and you go into that protective state, your heart rate yeah. elevates a little bit, your breath quickens a small bit, you stiffen up a wee bit. So it might be a case of giving someone some breathing techniques sitting in the car. And, and that begins to desensitize the environment. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And do you know what? It, it, it struck a chord with me because um, I'd say about, geez, I think possibly maybe 10 years ago, um, I, I was in a car crash and the car flipped upside down and two of us walked away, not scratch on us, right? Absolutely blessed. Um, but like you said, it's almost that 
that memory of that happening. Mm. Anytime I was on a similar road and I was going around a corner or, or there was cars coming towards me, it was almost like that automatic kind of, geez, I better slow down. Do you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Even, gri- even gripping the steering wheel tighter going past like a lorry or something. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's, it doesn't affect the width of the car or the road, but by gripping tighter, yeah. you feel safer. Do you know that kind of way? It's almost like that automatic <laughs> yeah. response. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that's very, very common um, with previous injuries. Uh, like taking it away from a car crash, even, even someone who's been like yourself, maybe rolled an ankle on a pitch the next time you get into that similar position again, your past experiences are going to dictate what happens. So yeah. you might go for that same challenge and be a little bit stiffer on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. I, you you know, because you've had that. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's where then that, that whole graded exposure piece comes and having a plan to get back to training. So I would say to you, go out on that pitch there and I want you to do 40 meter shuttles, walk back 50, 60%. And I want you to change direction. Now I want you back training Tuesday night with the lads, you know, get involved. So we're, we're gradually building up that safety. So then the next time you go into that full challenge, you've had all these experiences of we're able, we're able for this. So that, that protective tone that's carried in, in around the joint doesn't necessarily need to be there anymore. Is it, is it, and is it just having more confidence in your ability that the injury is not going to happen to you again almost? Yeah. Um, now, look, don't get me wrong. There is a strength element to it and there is a, a functional element to it and a mechanical element to it as well. You have to tick all those boxes. But a, a lot of the time, to give someone permission to move again is, is probably the biggest thing. To say, don't be afraid to do that. I know, what, I know it's a little bit miggly now, but yeah. the more we can do this and the more we practice this, the less niggly that's going to become because it, it's better for us. We, we're beginning to get freer movement, more thoughtless movement. So rather than, you probably see this in the gym as well, Mark, is it, like if you say to someone, um, do a lunge, the first time they do it, you can see it visibly on their face. How am I going to do this? Yeah. They don't know how to get down without shifting all over the place and people are falling. And, yeah, the but balance you pra- go. Yeah, you practice it and you get comfortable with feeling where the foot is and where the pressure is in the foot and where the knee is meant to go, and where the hip tilts. And then you come back to that person again in four weeks and say, do a lunge for me. They don't even think about it. It's automatic. So that's, so that's when it's, been, it's become a subconscious process. We, we don't need to worry about it. So they've initially started off like uh, consciously incompetent, if you like. I don't know how to do this. Yeah. And you're bringing them through by gradually exposing them every day to becoming unconsciously competent they don't know how they've just done it i'm writing down that, un- consciously incompetent i like <laughs> that i like that a lot that's very good yeah it, and you, you just take people through this this process of being consciously incompetent uh, sorry unconsciously incompetent where i don't know i don't know how to do it now now i am consciously incompetent i know i don't know how to do it yes now i'm becoming consciously competent mark has shown me how to do this now I'm going to practice it until it becomes a movement pattern that I don't even need to think about. Yeah, you just so then, you, you have it. Exactly. So then my brain doesn't need to allocate the same resources to doing that movement and can worry about something else. Yeah. It's like driving a car. And the first time you go, you're worried about the, the handbrake, the gears, the steering wheel, the mirrors. Exactly. Whereas yeah. now yeah, you, yeah. you get in, you load up, you have a quick look and you're gone, you know, because everything yeah. is just yeah. boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. Um, and mind yep. you, people are still incompetent, uh, no matter how much they <laughs> practice. <laughs> <laughs> now, sir, um, I, you touched on it there as well, like the, the holistic side of it, right? As you said, there's, mm. there's, there's an, yeah. an obvious um, mechanical issue with, with most injuries. Um, yeah. But the, I suppose the holistic side of it, when you look at someone's mm-hmm. sleep, um, their nutrition, yeah. their stress, um, their lifestyle um, mm-hmm. is there anything that you recommend in terms of we'll say if you had like your top three um, recovery strategies outside of the actual injury like things that yeah. don't involve rehab uh, exercise yeah. uh, treatments that kind of stuff um, what would you say just even in your own opinion would be like look is it is it sleep is it a certain amount of of uh, macronutrients in your food, protein, and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, 
is there yeah. things that you recommend to people or is there things that you're kind of saying well if you're not doing these things everything that we do over here is just going to take a lot longer um yeah like i would kind of see it as as you're almost trying to pick off the low-hanging fruit first um, you know before you're looking for the the elephants in the room rather than chasing the, the mouse so if someone comes into me and they're like look i've got really bad back pain um, and they go through the whole history and we do everything like one of the questions are how do you sleep what's your nutrition like are, are you hydrated what are your stress levels like you know in and out of work uh, and then you're, you're looking at right the guy says i sleep maybe three four hours a night okay that that's a problem so that's one of the low-hanging fruits that you can right look we need to address this now i, I give strategies on how to help but maybe it's not me that needs to help the person to do that but i, I will look at those areas as a as you say like a holistic piece um nutritional yeah look i have takeaway seven days a week i don't eat breakfast i don't you know so yeah, yeah look we let's let's talk to a nutrition coach for this one let's see if we can modify that slightly um so nutrition will be one sleep will be the other hydration a lot of people are yeah. dehydrated and your your bodies are primarily made up of water and if you, if you don't keep yourself hydrated you're going to feel a bit sluggish you some people will get headaches you know you wake up in the morning a little bit groggy hydration is a big thing as well so those are probably the three things that i would address with rehab exercise is probably the biggest one and if someone is afraid of exercise or doesn't want to do it what i recommend is just go out for a walk 30 minutes a day yeah do it for two weeks come back to me and tell me how you feel we'll do these little things later but if i can get you moving even a half an hour a day this is going from zero the benefit would be massive yeah like the physiological benefit, the the mental benefit, the emotion—it's just going to be very, very. It's hard. It's hard to quantify, you know. Um, but those will be the three things that I would I would go after um, outside of let's say traditional rehabilitation. So, um, and it's on the it's on the checklist for me at the, at the start of every conversation. <laughs> and have you ever found it difficult, I suppose, to get your point across to clients that look? I, I know I'm asking you to improve your sleep here, um, mm. but it's not a case of kind of, you know, I'm not asking you for the laugh. I'm not asking you because you, you come into me yeah. the yeah. clinic and you look tired. I'm saying this because the benefits to your recovery is going to be massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and that's again, um, again, I, I know I harp on a little bit, but it's going back to the assessment. It's going back to that, why is that person here in front of me? And how can I relate what I'm asking them to do to bring them to where they want to get to. So if you come into me with a twisted ankle, Mark, and you say, I want to get back playing 90 minutes, then my, my role is to show you what I'm asking you to do, how I'm going to get you back to that 90 minutes. Yeah. Does that make sense? So sure. if I say to someone, sleep, for example, and they're saying to me, look, my back pain is killing me, and I'm saying, right, you don't sleep well. Here's the reason why it's going to affect your back pain here's the reasons it's going to help and then it's a little bit more of an easier conversation to have so i'm always trying to relate it to the end goal and yeah. initially why you're here again I, I total agreement with you because even if someone starts training with myself i always like to really really figure out why do you know mm -hmm. like they'll mm -hmm. always say uh blues weight tone up right they're the kind of universals yeah. right yeah but yeah, yeah. if someone wants to lose weight right why because i want to look yeah. good with my bikini on all this why because there was a picture of me last year and i, I hated the way i looked i was low on confidence so you know i was covering my body mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. um yeah. and likewise as you said there like if i go over on an ankle and i'm saying i just want to get back to playing 90 minutes like i might want to get back playing 90 minutes but i also want to be able to be back in the restroom with the with the lads i want to be able to have exactly. back it's, it's the social exactly. side of it. instead of sitting yeah. in on a saturday and watching Dotty and Dotty and Blonded on RT one. I want to be, <laughs> uh, you know, I want to be down yep. on at the pitch yep. with the lads. Um, yeah, absolutely. People with low back pain coming in. Do you know they want to be able to play with their grandkids. Do you know it's not a case. Of, I want yep. to be pain free. Why do you want to be pain free? What's what are you, what yeah. are you missing yep. now that you now that you have pain? What's what are you not yeah. able to do? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. And, and and funny enough, you will see people are willing to put up with a little bit of pain as long as they have the function back to allow them to do that. So if I, if, if I have someone who has, like, say, a lot of back pain and they're, um, I'm just thinking of a client that I had previously, and they're like, you know, I want to get back to the gym. Why do you want to get back to the gym? It's because I want to see my friends there. And I want, you know, okay, yeah. 
get them to the point where they can go back to the gym with their strategies. The pain is not 100% gone, but functionally they're able to do what they want and they're back in the gym. Now we can build the, robust, the robustness and the resiliency and, and get rid of the pain. Uh, <laughs> it just went up. <laughs> Gone. I didn't touch that in the browser. Um, but yeah, <laughs> should we just leave it like that? Um, <laughs> but yeah, look, you were saying about the 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 robustness and getting them back to, yeah. back to full function again. Um, yeah. Like for me, one of the big things is it's not just about pain free, and we said this earlier. It's not just about being pain free. It's uh -huh. about having that that freedom and the confidence in your own body and your own ability to move again that yeah. ultimately will give you the freedom to kind of do what you want. Um, yeah. Like I've seen it down through the years and I want to touch on kind of pitch side stuff with you for a second out of my own pure curiosity. Um, mm -hmm. Like you see it the whole time, you see lads that uh, are strapping up their knees, they're strapping up their ankles, they're strapping up everything. Some of them go out into pitches like mummies um, <laughs> because of that previous history of injury and because yeah. of that, um, that, that fear, that nervousness, yeah. that... I can't jump up for a, a slitter and then land on this leg because my knee is going to buckle from under me. Yeah. And then you're kind of coming in by saying, well, part of the continuum of the rehab process is that we do get you doing single single leg hops. We get you bounding. We get you sprinting. Exactly. You know, we get you stopping, starting, uh, twisting, turning, left and right, you know, mm -hmm. and then eventually getting back into training. Um, yeah. And I think that <laughs> the, the approach that you have is something that I really admire and one of the reasons I asked you to come on is because even through the content you put out on, on your Facebook and Instagram, it's it makes it makes sense, you know, as opposed yeah. to right, you did your hamstring, oh look, one massage every week for at least four weeks, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, I could do yeah. a discount on four sessions and uh, yeah. you know and, and yeah. keep the income coming in. But if you can build a reputation for someone that right, this guy is not a massage a week for six weeks because you tore your hand yeah the guy he's look yeah let's do what we need to do for you and you keep exactly. coming back to your intake and i think that's yeah that's very yeah. important it's like right what happened how did it happen why did it happen what are the circumstances around it uh yeah. where do you want to get to you know if you just yeah. want to be able to sit at home without pain then we probably don't need to get you doing uh, deadlifts and and single leg exactly. and stuff and, and sport related uh, Instagram exactly type yeah. stuff like you yeah, said you yeah. know <laughs> fellas running around our back garden bouncing off the walls you know <laughs> um but i think i've really enjoyed the chat um i think that anyone that has listened to this and might be in i suppose a little bit of non-specific pain at the moment mm -hmm. um, i'm hoping that they might have a light bulb moment over something yeah. that, that we've spoken about um and whether it just encourages them to do work with it themselves or whether they might get in mm -hmm. contact with you to, you know, to speak a bit further. Yeah, yeah, look. yeah, absolutely. Do you know, um, I think that a lot of stuff that we've spoken about is, I won't say it's common knowledge, but I think it's stuff that people need to hear more often. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah, the yeah. fitness side of things as well. I see it the whole time on Instagram. You see, you see the fancy shit. You see the really yeah. top end, the, yeah. the, the six packs and the, the burpees on the beach and the top mm -hmm. of the cliff and all this stuff. What you don't see is someone walking into the gym, nervous as fuck, too stone exactly. overweight, yeah, exactly. worried about what the trainer will think of them if they lunge and lose their balance. Um, yeah. And I think the accessibility of it all needs to be a bit more, um, a bit more out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, like for me, it's, it's about, I'm almost trying to put myself out of a job uh, in a good way, you know, um, because like you say, there's uh, th there's no there's a benefit to me, but there's no benefit to the to the client on the table if all I'm doing is the same thing yeah. every week. Where's where's the change? Where's the positive adaptation? Where's the return to function? Where's the the checklist to say you couldn't walk when you came in? Now we're up to fifteen minutes on a treadmill. Whatever it is, there needs to be that there's, there's not the 45 minutes on the table there's your three exercises best of luck yeah you know um yeah. so yeah uh is it is it a little bit 
more challenging for me yeah absolutely because people do still have a view of physical therapy or therapists in general that do some kind of body work or rehabilitation is that I need the elbow in until this pain is gone and I'll be okay again but when you yeah. sit down and explain to people why this is important and why this process is important it's, it's like that light bulb moment oh yeah that makes sense and I think once you have that light bulb moment and the, the it makes sense, you get the buy in. And once you mm-hmm. have that, you're going to have a client that will do what they have to do, recover, yeah. achieve what yeah. they want to achieve. And yeah. I think from a business point of view, then it just makes sense then that you have someone that can say, well, listen, I'm working with a guy who's, who didn't just take 50 quid a week off me for a 40 minute sports massage and yeah. hope that I got better. Do you know, yeah. I had a guy that was yeah. invested that took me through step by step and it took maybe six mm-hmm. weeks longer than me six rubs, but I haven't had a reoccurrence. I still go yeah. back to him every now and again for advice or, do you know, if I have a little niggle, yeah. we'll have a chat on what do I need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And no, I absolutely, I, I really like your, I suppose, your philosophy on it, your knowledge on it. And um, yeah, if I ever do the ankle again, I'll be straight down. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you're, you're one of the ones now that I'd be saying to you, come down before you do the ankle and I'll make sure you never <laughs> do it again. <laughs> I just strap it up. Again. <laughs> 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 come here to me. Uh, we'll spend two or three more minutes and then I'll leave you go. Yeah, um, no I, don't, I don't want to keep you, but I, I, I do enjoy kind of picking brains on this stuff. Um, you do a lot of pitch side work. Yeah, um, kind of covering uh, games and this, that, and everything. Yeah. And this is something that I've thought about myself. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. When someone gets injured on the pitch, right, or they get a little knock or niggle, and we all see on the TV, I suppose, that the physio runs out and they have the bag and they kind of they put on a little bit of spray or a little bit of ice or whatever. Yeah. Technically speaking, right, is there anything that can be done for someone on the pitch with a niggle like that? I've done it myself. I, I've covered games for first aid and and. and I've done I've done the physio role, but you kind of run out. And you, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Grand job, stretch. You know, yeah, look, feels fine. Yeah. Pitch side, if a player is truly injured, he has to yeah. come off. If he's not injured, if someone like yourself, myself, stays on the sideline, can they mm-hmm. just get on with it? <laughs> like, so, yeah, look, what, what's it's... what's your take? What do you do when you go? If someone is down and you you run out, <laughs> what like do you have a pitch side protocol? Do you do anything in particular? Or is it just a case of right? What we got in front of me? Ah, oh, Jesus, Johnny, our grand, but come on, get on with it. <laughs> you you I get I, I'll assess the situation when I run onto the pitch mark. So like, uh, like with everything, there you'll always run onto a pitch to someone and go, he's all right, yeah. <laughs> you know. And then you'll you'll run onto a pitch to someone and be like. It's not very often this guy stays down. Let's yeah. see what's going on here. Or you know, you go out and you say, like the guy might say, look, I I, I felt something in the in the quad muscle. You do a quick on pitch assessment. Yes. Um, the difficulty comes in where I feel you're not capable of continuing, but a player is not going to tell you that. So that's where yeah. I have to make that decision. Um, and I'll tell the coaches, look, he's not right. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like he's able to give you 100% for the rest of the game he might do more damage and then the coach is called in at that point to, to pull the player out or not but I sort of learned very quickly in the early days that players are just going to lie completely yeah. to their face and say I'm, I'm fine I'm fine so you do there is an element of sometimes you got to show them so if you say look I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine right do this oh I can't you're not fine yeah. time to go Bye. so it, it, it's kind of assessed on the situation. Now, there's a couple of little tips and tricks you can do as well for guys, you know, little pinch in the back. <laughs> <They're> like, well, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly the pain in the leg is gone. <laughs> That's it. And the last question, do you have a magic sponge? No, no, actually, I don't. No sponge in the bag at all. <laughs> no sponge. <laughs> Those days are gone. Oh, yeah, I, I had that magic sponge treatment so many times. <laughs> And hey, it always worked. Always worked. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least I told him it did. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, if anyone would like to uh, look into uh, working with you or have you working on mm-hmm. them, um, where can they find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, just look up either Bodyworks or W Halloran NMT. You'll find me that way. Um, or just do a Google search for Bodyworks Waterford. Uh, you'll find us through there. So. Um, pretty much the easiest way to get in contact with, with me. Um, phone numbers everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, the whole lot. 
deadly stuff. Uh, Wayne Hallam, uh, Body Works Clinic um, in Waterford. Thank you very much for coming out with me and having the chats. And, uh, You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me on. Could be the, could be the first of many. We'll have to do a, a second take <laughs> in, a, in another couple of months. <laughs> no problem at all, Mark. <laughs>